Four days after our last conversation, and only hours after the session is over, I revisit Senator John Marty and talk about end of session negotiations. Right. The only thing we heard from the governor is adopt what I want. And again, the way it comes back to us then is we, we tell him, well, Governor, we, we don't like this and this and this and this. Now let's negotiate. We pass it back to him. He hands us the same piece of paper back again saying, no, here's what we're going to do. And we say, he must be really serious. So if we had 20 objections, we'll say, well, we'll, we'll take off seven or eight of our objections and then we pass it back to him with only 12 or 13 objections. And then he passes the same thing back to us again. We think he must really, really be serious. And we cut off another six or seven of them. And then we hand it back and he comes back again. That's, that's the way we negotiate. Do you think this process was described to the public very well? No. I think, I think if the public thought it was a good negotiation, I think it was not. I, I'd say the way we ought to do it is the way I use the illustration I give is give him a taste of his own medicine. And then you'll see how negotiations ought to work. And that is, if he gives us a list of 10 of what he wants and we have 20 objections to it, pass it back to him. And when he comes back with the same thing, we say, what part of no don't you understand? Hmm. And pass it back to him. He comes back again. What part of no don't you understand? And say, Governor, we're willing to work with you as soon as you want to work together. But until then, why don't we go home? And as soon as you're ready to work, we'll work with you. We'll call the legislature back. You can call them back in special session. We could wrap it up in one day. But instead, we're so afraid of that, for whatever reason, that, that we tell him, okay, we come that way. Um, we give in. It would be people around here, if, if, if we suggested we throw a tax proposal at him and he vetoes it, and we send him the same one the next day, and the day after, and the day after, and the day after, people would say, why would you waste your time doing that? Because he'd never sign it. Huh. Well, instead... He does that to us, and we think, instead of thinking, don't these folks get it? Um, he I says never really he's, heard that articulated no. until talking to you the other night. Yeah, well, that's, he, in effect, keeps handing us the same thing over and over, and instead of saying, don't you get it, Governor? We're not going to do that. We're not going to cut the, these folks from their health care. We're not going to raise taxes on these low-income renters. We're not going to do this. And pass it back to him. And every time he passes the same thing, you tell him the same thing. Someday it might sink into him, but he only tells us once or twice he's not going to accept any no, no new taxes, except for the ones he wants. No new taxes. And we think, oh boy, when he tells us the second time, he must be serious. So why do we let him do that to us? So I guess we could have imagined this perhaps as the way he would have performed in his presidency too. And it actually reminded me of George Bush and, mm -hmm. and how he cooperated. And, and, and to me, why Democrats in Congress um, treated him, dealt with him the way they did. Oh, we're powerless. He's the executive. He has all the power. So when Barack Obama gets to be president and has all the power, well, we've better we got to deal with it. <laughs> we can't win. I mean, we can't win. We only have 59 Democrats in the Senate now, when 50s and 51s a majority. We can't have cooperate now because they can block us. Hmm. And I keep thinking, George Bush, he never had 59 people. It appears in as though you have two different strategies then for the Republicans and, and the Democrats. And I haven't figured that out. I haven't figured out why the logic of that is, but I think Democrats are just too unsure of themselves in recent years, and I think that's where we have to get the courage of our convictions back. Another thing that changed last night is that they added, I believe, $10 million more million to the GAMC fund. But in reflecting on that, you have to think, is $10 million significant when it comes to medical dollars? Right. Because my mom once had a million-dollar health bill alone. Yeah. $10 well, million you, you, then means... $10, 10 million <laughs> is, is a drop in the bucket. I mean, the, the federal money, the early adoption of the medical assistance, the Medicaid funds, that would have been a billion-plus dollars for the state. That's a lot of money there. Hmm. But, an um, order of magnitude. It's, it's an order of magnitude greater, and that's the way we ought to be doing it is the bigger picture things. That's why I think it's so important we adopt universal health care. So health care is treated like police and fire, not something you take away from people, not something you can say, well, with these folks, they're not going to qualify anymore. That's, we need a whole new way of looking at this. Do you think someday it'll be considered to be a right? I think it should be. I think it's got to be. I think our country signed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which says to everybody else in the world that health care is a right. But to our own people, we don't think 
for some reason. And knowing you, I would think that that's a moral and ethical yeah, position. It's, it's it's something that the rights are something that we as human beings, everybody deserves, and they have a right to them. That's the why we come up with the word right. Um, but the bottom line is that with what the governor got out of it this time, it was a hundred times more of what he got than what we wanted. I, I have mean, to admit if, too, if you're breaking in percentages, it's not 50-50, it's more right. like 90. We're rough right now. And also 98 to 2 or something, I don't know. We, and the ink is still drying, and I think we've learned with GAMC too that it takes 72 hours or more to actually understand what has actually been voted on right. and passed. And we, there, we're there still always may be is. surprises and interpretations of things, but, mm -hmm. but I, I guess if I was to encourage future legislators and how to deal with it, I'd say don't give up your power. Don't be afraid of things. I mean, the fear of a special session, the governor was going to call one anyway if he wanted to. Um, to me, our job isn't to avoid a special session. Our job is to serve the public. And we, I just feel that the state moved backwards. Two years ago, I was co-chair of the Commission on Ending Poverty in Minnesota by 2020. Hmm. We finished that report a year and a half ago now. And we've moved backward ever since then. We're not moving towards eliminating poverty by 2020. We're making poverty three times as bad by 2020 at the direction we've been headed. And we don't have to do that. But it's been state policies that are making it worse. The bottom line is it's not supposed to be about strategy. It's supposed to be about people like that. Ooh. And I think we did focus on strategy at the end there. I think a lot of Democrats are thinking and outfoxing ourselves thinking that the way to win an election is to, well, if we cave in and get out of here as fast as we can, then we can start campaigning. Well, I'm saying maybe if you fight for the people who need us to fight for, if we fight for no more cuts in higher education, because the students who are on the seven-year plan to get the four-year degrees, I mean, that doesn't, they need some advocates here. And we'd be better off if we'd stand here and fight for it. And if it dragged into a special session, I know that'd be ugly. I don't want a special session. But, you know, at a certain point, you got to say, we're not here to get reelected. We're here to do the right thing. And frankly, doing the right thing sometimes is smarter politically.